Hello, my name is Sam Feltham. I'm the Director of the Public Health Collaboration and welcome to the PHC Virtual Conference 2020. The coronavirus has changed all of our lives, but where there's an obstacle, there's also an opportunity. And that opportunity comes in the guise of this virtual conference. Earlier this year, we had to postpone our two main events, the annual conference and the Real Food Rocks Festival until next year. These events allow us to connect, learn and grow, but they also help us raise crucial funds for the PHC to continue. With that in mind, and before we let the next presenter speak, this virtual conference is 100% free for all. But if you find the content valuable today, then please consider donating £2 or whatever you can afford through the Total Giving website via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate. Or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world, and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation on the comments section here on YouTube or via the hashtag PHCVCon2020 on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for your support, take care and stay safe. everyone thanks very much for dropping in to listen to this presentation on mind and body coherence before i start i'd just like to say a big thank you to sam feltham and the public health collaboration for inviting me along to this wonderful event um, my name is dr joe delaney and um, i've been in the business of health and medicine now for over 40 years I have a PhD in medicine and basically what my research investigated was how what goes on between the ears, how it affects the body and how what goes in on in the body actually affects our thinking and what goes on between the ears. So if you like, uh, my particular area was how the brain and the heart and the heart and the brain actually interact with one another. So um, in this presentation, I'm hopefully going to share some tips that may be useful, some mindful-based trips or mindfulness-based tips that will help you to remain calm in these very unsettling times and to be able to think clearer. And maybe then, then you can pass those on to the people that you work with. So people ask me, Joe, what exactly is your field? And I say, well, I'm a psycho neuro endocrino immunologist. Um, and they say, stop messing about, Joe. Just tell us simply what it is you do. And I say, well, I work in the field of integrative medicine. And basically what that is, is um, basically it's how our psychology impacts upon our nervous system, and then, which then impacts upon um, our endocrine system, or endocrine system, which then impacts upon the way our immunology works. So really, how we think, how we perceive the world, both consciously and unconsciously, will send signals then through the nervous system to various organs of the, the body, um, to the muscles and to the endocrine system, to the seven major endocrine glands, how that then secretes or they secrete substances into the bloodstream, which impacts upon the way that our immune system works, including how the immune system affects the way stem cells work um, and the way our DNA ex expresses itself. So in actual fact is how we think it, to a large degree uh, becomes through this process um, who we are and um, what we become. Sometimes integrative medicine has different names. It's sometimes called integrated medicine or integrated health and medical practice. Uh, and another term is uh, mind-body medicine. And mind-body medicine, the general definition is it's a field that uses a variety of techniques which are designed to enhance the mind's capacity to affect bodily function and symptoms but I'd just like to go a bit further than that and maybe extend it because this is really, this definition is about the mind's capacity to affect the body. But I feel that we can turn that round to a large degree and because of my research, how we can change the body to change the mind to affect the way um, we make choices and hopefully help uh, make, make us, help us to make healthier choices. So in my view, it's a field that uses a variety of approaches to allow both the mind and body to act together for optimal health and well-being. And thus, we are presented with a wholesome, wholehearted, whole-person approach to 
the whole health in mind, body and spirit. So truly a holistic approach that brings in elements such as nutrition, um, exercise and all those different sorts of things that I'll talk about later on. When I say spirit here, what I mean by spirit is the essential nature or the essential individual being within all of us, or if you like, the, the core of the individual. So this then allows a sense of um, coherence and comfort within ourselves. So what is coherence? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, it's the quality of forming a unified whole. And to me, at least, that this it's a quality, it's an attribute, um, it's, it's an active example of, if you like, reconstituting and defragmenting ourselves uh, to, to restore us back to a whole systems approach. Um, in order to get a different perspective, the Cambridge English Dictionary says it's a situation when the parts of something fit together in a natural and a reasonable way. And I like this as well because it mentions in the same sentence both naturalness and reasonableness. And I feel that that's what mind-body medicine is. It's about a restoration of our true and essential nature. Um, and it's not forced. It's more of a sort of a let go back into the flow of who we are. And I've made a little sort of definition of, of uh, what may be helpful. It's uh, when all your bits and pieces are working together in a balanced and harmonious way to provide optimal health. That to me is what mind and body coherence is. Why am I so interested in this field and so enthusiastic about passing this message on? Well, for many, many years, I suffered the horrendous effects of stress. And as the stress got work, anxiety, and as the anxiety got worse, then the exhaustion that, and the depression that came with that. And then for many years, suicidal ideation, um, drinking excessively, eating excessively, and all the things associated with um, the things I'm going to talk about today. So really, um, you've got a health professional here who can say some big words now and then, uh, but also has gone through the personal lived experience. And so I think that that may be more helpful because I can share a bit more sort of depth and weight about this whole situation. So what, in fact, is optimal health? Well, in order to have optimal health, we need um, an optimal amount of emotional arousal. We need to be fired up to a certain degree where we've got a sort of a balanced amount of emotion. Right? Uh, in order to perform well, to be happy and to have optimal health, we need to be in this balanced, optimal and flexible emotional state. However, um, occasionally, um, well, not occasionally, but quite often actually is, if we don't have em enough emotional arousal, then we can tend to become depressed, we can be bored, we can lack vitality, and we can just lack purpose really. But on the other hand, if we've got too much tension, right, then we can tend to become stressed. You know? So really what we're looking for is, how can we achieve an area of optimal arousal or tension? Because if, like most people, we're in a high state of anxiety because of the way that the world is situated at the moment, then we can tell all sorts of problems can ensue. So what actually is stress? Well, according to the, uh, the UK's health and safety executive, it's an adverse reaction that people have to all kinds of, uh, to excessive pressure or other types of demands placed upon them. So really, as, as I've just mentioned in the, in the last slide, is we need a certain amount of pressure and tension to get us out of bed, to face the challenges of our daily lives. But when it becomes excessive pressure, then it really becomes a problem then. And so any threat then or demand made upon us, whether it's from inside, intrinsic, extrinsic, physical, psychological, social, this will all provoke the body's defense arousal mechanism and prepare us for what's um, for action to defend ourselves. This, as most of you know, will be called the fight or flight response. So the fright is the fear, it's the perception of threat that automatically um, sends our body into a defense arousal or protective stance. This is more of a technical explanation. This, this is just a diagram to explain how all these systems are supposed to work together and during stress, how they can sort of become fragmented. So at the top here, we have the higher centers. This really represents where our thinking and our choosing takes place. 
So this should be, we should be able to be objective about the world and the choices that we make. Um, this is this bit here is the midbrain where we go into the midbrain, and that's associated with places like the you know areas called the limbic system, the amygdala, the hippocampus, all those midbrain functions here. And this is basically the area where these the processing of both our thoughts and our feelings are put into action, and our physiology then sort of activates as a consequence of what's going on here. So back to the psycho neuroendocrino immunology approach. So in stress what tends to happen is we get an increased activation of this here, the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system is like the acceleration part of the, body, uh, the nervous system. So when we perceive a threat, the accelerator goes on. And at the level of the heart, our heart rate will speed up and the pressure of the flow of the heart will increase as well. So the pumping uh, volume and the pumping contraction strength will increase and it will increase it in, um, in rate as well. And also what happens is when the sympathetic nervous system is on, right, our uh, blood vessels constrict in order to send our blood pressure higher. The blood pressure goes higher to deliver oxygen more quickly to the muscles in order for us to be able to fight or flight. That's basically what happens. And in that process, we have something called uh, the amygdala hijack. And this is quite well known now. And what actually happens is, the amygdala hijack is when we disconnect almost from our logical thinking mind and we go into defensive thinking. And so this is when the midbrain takes over um, uh, in the feeling center. So this is our um, cognitive capacity. This is our affective capacity where we have feelings and emotions. And this is our psychomotor ability when then it's activated and we take action in those areas. So we have an amygdala hijack where the midbrain takes over. We get something that's technically called an egocentric contraction, where all we can really think of is, how can I get out of this situation? So we're locked into, if you like, sometimes very, very irrational thought and very cloudiness of thought. And we just go round in the same old loop, not being able to make any decisions. On the contrary to this, we have what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's sometimes associated with um, the rest and digest response. So this is more to do with relaxation and this is the braking system of the nervous system which allows, when this goes on, it will allow the heart rate to speed down, allow our blood vessels to relax, our blood pressure comes down and we get to a state of a more optimal and healthy balance. So the nerve that's associated with this, the parasympathetic nervous system, it's called the vagus nerve at the level of the heart. So that's the term that we'll bring back later on. So in excessive pressure then, what are the sort of things that actually happen to us and happen to our body? The first thing that happens is that we become fuzzy headed. You know, So this is an indication then that maybe our fight and flight's in play and we're really thinking about more defensiveness rather than logical thinking. Our eyes uh, become... Uh, the. The parasympathetic nervous system is to do with um, moisture and during fight and flight those responses are curtailed and we become more involved in sort of being coming defensive if you like. So we can get dry eyes and start to get um, sort of sore eyes as well and itchy eyes and stuff like that. We can also see things that aren't there but that's just another problem that we get sometimes in stress. Um, we can get a lot of head, neck and shoulder tension. And this is very, very common when people are stressed that over the long term, if we don't do anything about it, then what actually happens is the stress builds, our muscles become more and more tense, we lose flexibility, um, we start to get joint pain all associated with chronic muscle tension. Sounds a bit boring, chronic muscle tension, but it's easily resolved, as I'll talk about later on. We get lack of taste. I mean, this is um, a strange thing, but um, we start again because our digestive processes are curtailed in fight or flight temporarily uh, and sometimes over the long term that we start to see, um, seek out more spicy and more sweet substances. So that's a part of this um, um, becoming more aware. If we become aware of these things, then we can do something about it at an earlier stage. Our heart rate stays high. So these are the, um, the important... Um, physical things that can happen and, and bring on further consequences down the line. So our heart rate stays high. 
and will reset itself if we stay in this chronic state of stress. We get sleep disturbance. I mean, this is a really big problem where people are um, telling me that they can't go to sleep because their mind's on a million miles an hour all the time uh, and they're totally exhausted, but they just don't seem to be able to get to sleep. When they do eventually drop off, they're waking up at two, three and four in the morning with vivid dreams and they're finding it really difficult. And then after a couple more hours sleep, they wake up totally exhausted because all of this activity that's going on in the night time. We get digestive problems. I mean, things like irritable bowel syndrome is very, very uh, common and very well known to be stress related because of this now imbalance in both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. I'm going quite quickly here because I've sort of had to cut this talk down by half. So forgive me if I'm sort of going, <laughs> going too quickly. I'm stressed. No, I'm not. <laughs> So a chronic low back pain as well, because of the overall chronic muscle tension, our back um, suffers from all, we can suffer from all sorts of musculoskeletal problems. We start then because of that becoming inflexible in our joints, we start to get joint pains. Sometimes this can actually go towards um, worsening and it will cause an osteoarthritis and, and conditions like that. Another uh, important thing is our blood pressure stays high, so this can be uh, detrimental to our health further down the line. The blood pressure, as I mentioned, stays high because we're still sending signals to say that we're um, in a threatening situation and we need to deliver oxygen more readily to our um, muscles. We start to get lack of sensation because our body becomes numb as our uh, awareness is taken more towards our head rather than uh, to our body. And then we can get all sorts of thermoregulatory problems. We can be hot in cold environments and cold in hot environments. And that fluctuates all the time. So these are just some of the uh, mainly physical symptoms that can happen as a result of chronic stress. Some of the psychological effects, we just feel overwhelmed all the time. And I'm very familiar with these feelings because this is what I was like for many, many years and didn't really have the awareness to understand that I was on a const in a constant state of stress and tension all the time. I have racing thoughts that I've talked about, find difficulty concentrating. So might have the intention to do work properly, but when I actually set about it, I keep getting distracted and can't sit still long enough to actually focus on any work. Excuse me. Just feel nervous, irritable and discontented. You know, try to sit down, know I need some rest, but I was a unable to just sit with myself for any period of time. Had to get up and do something and keep, keep active. And I see it in a way now, this is the body's mechanism to try and dissipate some of the energy that's building all the time. So felt constantly worried, anxious or scared. You know, and people are, are like this now, they're uh, worried about the future. Um, there's no certainty. We're in completely uncharted territory here. So nobody really knows uh, what's coming up in the future. So that can take us into worried about the future, financial concerns, our own health concerns, the concerns of people around us. All those things build up and create anxiety. Just as a matter of interest, anxiety, um, the root word of anxiety is uh, angustia, which means a tightening or a narrowing and it's normally associated with a tightening or a narrowing of the throat. And so that's why some people feel in stress that they're being almost like gagged and being gripped at the level of the throat. So this might be something to be aware of. That If you have that feeling, it may suggest that you're in this fight or flight response and that you need to try and take a step back and practice some of the tips that are coming up. Well, as a consequence then of our exhaustion, we can feel a lack of self-confidence then. And we can't seem to be able to um, step up to the plate as we normally would. Sleeping, I've mentioned the sleeping side of things. Uh, we tend then, because we feel disempowered, we can start to avoid things that we really need to do in order to solve some of the problems that we've got. Or we might um, avoid uh, contacting people who are having problems with as well because we don't feel that we can stand up for ourselves. I'm very, very familiar with all, the, all these things here. Uh, we tend to eat more or if it's really, really serious and people are gripped very, very intensely in the gut, some people can actually eat much less and find it difficult to eat in, you know, there's restrainers and non-restrainers about food. Most people are non-restrainers. I am one of those. <laughs> 
and we can drink or smoke more than usual. And that's, that's what actually happened to me. I felt that I would take more and more cigarettes to get the stimulation I needed to stay in the, um, in the sort of trying to get the work done and trying not to disappoint people. But then in order to remove all this chronic tension I had, I used to find that if I drank enough, temporarily it would relieve me. And then I became addicted to the alcohol and so on as the story goes. So what can we do to counteract this stress response? Well, the first thing I learned is that I had no idea of what the body signals were sending me, what, what my body was trying to tell me um, that I was stressed, I was tense. So um, in order to sort of get on and cope, that's why I used the alcohol because it numbed me so I could sort of carry on with my day-to-day -day work. So one thing I've learned is that to become aware of the body, uh, and now I'm sort of acutely and intently aware of when my body tenses up anywhere. And uh, when I have that now, rather than taking any tablets to numb or dumb the pain, um, I actually, um, I don't drink anymore, by the way. So that's a really positive thing. But um, I tend to take a step back now and almost inquire of my body, what's it actually trying to tell me? And then I'll try and do something about that. So unfortunately, I haven't got time now to explain this anymore. But there are numerous uh, mindfulness applications that will help. Maybe you can download some um, mindfulness and guided meditations that will help to take you through various parts of your body and give you an inclination where, where there's any tension so that you can come out and do something about it. So that's the first thing I'd say is become acutely aware of your body and your body sensations. Get to know yourself at the deepest level uh, and therefore um, resolve to do something about it there and then to, to solve these problems. What else can we do? Well, rather than relying really, I mean, I, I got to a point where I'd come to the end of my thinking. I just couldn't think at all anymore. I didn't know how to get out of the situation and I was almost like in a headlock of just not being able to think any useful, useful thoughts at all. So rather than rely on our brain, right, how can we, in actual fact, turn to this organ here? How can we get the way that our heart works to change the way that our head works to give us space to make better decisions? And that's what I'm going to explain in a second is because you know, if we can get our signals, if we get the heart to work in a particular way, then it can send signals back. So our ECG, if you like, can change our EEG, and that will change the way our brain waves work. We can get into a more relaxed state in our minds. We get more space then to make healthier decisions, and then everything changes from there. And that's what I found out from my personal experiences that we can actually hack our physiology to change our psychology. So rather than trying to put more and more thoughts in here to strengthen our willpower to get on with stuff, we can actually turn this on its head and use our heart to change our head to change the choices we make to, uh, for a better quality of life. And so that's the next tip is become aware of our breathing. Because what I've learned is that the vagus nerve that's the parasympathetic nerve that feeds the heart or, or um, sends information to the heart. We can actually breathe because breathing, consciously breathing in a certain way, can change the way that the vagus nerve works. It can increase what's called vagal tone. It can allow then the heart to reduce in its um, contractility and its rapidity. It can slow the heart rate down. That will then send signals back to the brain, which changes the brainwave pattern. But in that process, not only does it slow the heart down, but it also impacts upon the way that the sympathetic nervous system works and it restores some sort of emotional balance then. I know that's a bit complicated, uh, but I'll try and sort of, at the end, is just sort of conclude and try and explain this a bit more. But... When I say listen to your heart, I'm talking about now basically listening to our bodies and checking in most of the time to see if we're comfortable, if we're relaxed, if our muscles are flexible. And so this is what actually happens is that all these signals here from our body and the way we interpret signals from our outside environment will send signals through our brain and our nervous system. Here we have the parasympathetic 
and the sympathetic branches of what's called the autonomic nervous system, they, they will actually impact and send signals then. This co combination here will send signals to the heart and then this, um, this pattern presents itself at the heart, this heart rate variability pattern. I know this is a bit complicated, but what we can actually do is, if we can actually change the way we breathe and also change the way that our mood is in. So we, if we can influence and bring in a positive mood state, then by using slow, deep breathing and a positive mood state, we can change the way the signals go into our central nervous system and correspondingly through our autonomic nervous system to the heart and we can actually affect a change in our heart rate variability pattern. This pattern then will send signals back through these afferent nerves and these uh, pressure receptors back into our central nervous system which can impact upon the way that we think. So it's complete sort of reversal of things like cognitive behavioral therapy where we can actually, not that I'm against cognitive behavioral therapy, but I'm saying that we can change our physiology to change our psychology to make um, different choices. So this is um, a heart rate variability signal, right, of somebody who's in a stressful circumstance. And you can see here that we've got this very jaggedy sort of pattern, very incoherent and very raggedy pattern. And if we do what's called a power spectral analysis of this, we can see that the various spikes of power, if you like, half power, are very diffuse and the, uh, right across in various frequencies. This next um, tachygram is somebody breathing at a slow rate with a positive emotion. And just by changing our respiration rate and our mood state, and by practicing this breathing, this mindful breathing, we can get the heart to work in this very coherent way. And amazingly, what happens is, when we do a power spectral analysis of this, all the power then has become coherent and focused virtually at one point here. And this represents at about six breaths per minute. So the power, rather than being diffuse, the power has come here. So our heart's working in a much more balanced, a much more coherent and a much more focused way. This will then send signals back to our brain, which will affect the way our brain waves uh, work. So this is just a graph as well, just to explain that. How can breathing change the way our heart power is? So these humps here, these represent the amount of heart rate variability. And it's been shown now in many, many studies that the amount of heart rate variability determines our overall health. So the more heart rate variability we have up to a point uh, and in a coherent way uh, will represent our um, optimal health and well-being status. So at 12 breaths per minute, this was the amount of heart power. At nine breaths per minute, we can see that we've increased our heart rate variability. But here at six breaths per minute, breathing with a positive emotion, there's an exponential increase in how our heart's working and how it's focused. So that's just a, a quick representation of the science behind this, is how we can change our breathing to change our mind, really. Change our breathing to change the way our heart works to change our minds. So I've just put up this here, it is, and this is how we do heart-centered breathing, is we place our hands on our heart. You imagine that you're breathing in a gentle, positive feeling from the palm of your hand and deep into your heart. You breathe this feeling in for five seconds, so it's a positive feeling. In, two, three, four, five. Then stop for two seconds and then breathe that feeling all the way back out again. Then once again, stop for two seconds. Then we repeat that cycle. Now this is what I learned is that I learned to practice this initially for three 10-minute sessions a day and I practiced this for 90 days and in that process then I was able then when any threat or came in I could feel the fight and flight coming in because of tension in my body I could practice this heart-centered breathing that would help me to emotionally disengage from the problem to clear my mind to give me more opportunity to look at the various options open to me. So other ways to actually um, impact and restore, um, if you like, the technical terms called sympathovagal balance at the level of the heart. How can we restore 
um, and get back into a coherent state. Well, I've talked about mindful breathing and body awareness. But well, this led me into meditation. It was something I completely and utterly disregarded initially until I went through this process. So maybe it was a big learning trip for me anyway. Uh, so meditation, and I can sit very, very quietly now for quite a long time in a deep state of peace and relaxation. And that helps me to get a different perspective on things as well. Aerobic exercise. I do lots and lots of jogging now. And that also helps me if I jog in a mindful way and become aware of my breathing as well. That also helps me. I mean, I'm 65 years of age now. I feel like a 17 year old. And so, you know, things have turned around completely for me. And that's why I'm trying to pass this message on to everybody else. Yoga, Hatha yoga. I practice a lot of the principles of Hatha yoga, especially hip stretching because of the running I do, but also making sure that if there's any tension in my muscles, I practice various yoga techniques to release that tension and to restore balance in my muscles as well. Tai Chi, I've become um, an instructor of Tai Chi and Qigong. And these are things, once again, that I wouldn't look at. Uh, I didn't even consider because my head was more uh, in a scientific sort of um, uh, direction. So I'm sort of, in a way, glad that it happened to me and that I've come out of it. Massage, although with social isolation, this is a problem now. Um, but aromatherapy massage, massage in all its various forms, like myofacial trigger point massage, that again has helped me to unlock any tension in my body and helped me to do the yoga stretching. And healthy diet, I've become very, very aware of the things uh, that I'm eating and ingesting, and I've become much, much, much less toxic in the things that I eat. And dancing. I love dancing. My kids hate me dancing, but I don't care anymore. Right, I just dance as if nobody's around because it makes me feel free and it makes me feel joyful. And, you know, it helps me to cultivate my inner smile because breathing that smile in helps me to feel much better about things. So the take home message is just sit and become aware of your body and your breathing. And tip number three is don't forget to smile because I spent such a long time being miserably unhappy um, that, you know, things have turned around for me and uh, I'm just trying to sort of pass that message on and hope that you maybe you'll pay attention to some of these things and practice them yourself. So thanks very much indeed. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, presenting this and I hope that you get some benefit from it. Thank you.